This is Book TV's live coverage of the 14th Annual National Book Festival. Thank you, Thank Mr. Rubenstein. You're still mic'd up here. They'll take that off. 202 is the area code if you would like to dial in. If you want to get in line here as well, we'll be taking questions from the audience as well. For Doris Kearns Goodwin, live on Book TV on C-SPAN 2, 202-585-3890 if you live in the East and Central time zones, 585-3891. For those of you in the Central or the Pacific time zone and the Mountain time zone as well, we'll begin taking those calls in just a minute. Go ahead and dial in. Live coverage on Book TV on C-SPAN 2, and we've got people in line here. We'll begin taking those calls as well. Ms. Goodwin, thank you for joining us here on Book TV for another 50 minutes worth of calls from our national audience. But let's start with this gentleman right over here in line. Yes, I have a question. I want to go back to the team of rivals and the relationship between Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass in terms of bringing the end of slavery, because we, we often, we, in a sense, celebrate the Emancipation Proclamation. We marked that anniversary. But in, in, but in a real sense, blacks were not free until they were behind the Union lines. So there's that time in 1864, we're now at the 150 mark, when there was a, a, a temptation to have a compromise which would preserve slavery in the South and not bring the freedom that Frederick Douglass would want. And I guess he was becoming even critical of Lincoln, you know, in public. So they would have at least two meetings that I know of. Uh, could you just discuss oh, that? Oh, I mean, the bit? meetings between Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln are extraordinary historical moments because, as your question suggests, I mean, Douglass was the agitator, and he was wanting to move Lincoln further. He was the head of a movement, and Lincoln had to be the political man figuring out how far can I go when. And some of their early meetings, I think there was some tension between them. But eventually, Douglas came to a great respect for Lincoln. And, and once he finally opened the doors to African Americans to come in as soldiers, Douglas played a big role in mobilizing them to come into the army. He was upset that they weren't getting the same pay and the same prop privileges of the whites. And he talked to Lincoln about that. But the, the, the great moment really occurs that in 1860, um, for when the election of November is coming up and it's August and you're absolutely right the Republican politicians are coming to Lincoln and they're saying to him the only way you're going to win this election because the North is so weary of this war is and there's so many people that have died is to get the South to the bargaining table and have peace talks and the only way they'll do that is if you promise to compromise on slavery and you'll still get the Union but you compromise on slavery but no way was he even thinking about that. In fact, he said, I would be damned in time and eternity if I turned my back on the black soldiers. He turned those politicians out without a second thought. They thought he would lose the election. He thought he would lose the election, possibly, but it didn't matter. That was his moment of conviction. And then what happens is, despite the despair in the country about the way the war was going, um, Sherman takes Atlanta in September. The whole mood changes, and he wins the election. And then who does he want most at his second inaugural but Frederick Douglass? And he brings him in, and the first person he says to, what did you think of my inaugural? It's your opinion I want. And Douglass said, Mr. President, it was a sacred effort. So that relationship between the agitator and the politician had its moments of tension, but in the end was an extraordinary positive thing for both men. Let's take another question from the audience right over here. Do you have water right here? Oh, thank you. I was uh, interested that you met with Barack Obama and that he read, of course I know he read Team of Rivals. I kind of wish he'd read the Roosevelt book because my biggest frustration with Barack Obama has been his lack of using the bully pulpit. I mean, I feel like whether it was health care or Syria or any other issue, he seems to, during elections, you know, have that ability to be verbal and, and, and inspire people. And then, um, I, you know, I just miss that from his presidency. And why do you think that is? And also, I wish you'd eventually do a book about him, because I think he's got a head full of interesting ideas. <laughs> well, you know, it's a very interesting question, I think, to ask to what extent is the bully pulpit today as powerful as it was in earlier times? I mean, when you think about it, when Lincoln was, was speaking to the country, written word was the king. So the fact that he was such a good writer 
was very important because the speeches would be pamphletized and everybody would read the full speech would be in the newspaper. If, if Obama were in that time, it would have been more suited for him because when you read his speeches, they often read better than sometimes the delivery because the teleprompter hasn't been friendly with him in a certain sense. And then by the time Teddy Roosevelt came along, he was perfect for the technology of his time because he was able to speak in that colorful language that made headlines. FDR comes on the age of the radio with that perfect conversational voice. And then Reagan and JFK are right for the age of television. What happens now is even when a president gives a speech, unlike those earlier times when the only three networks would cover it, they break away for pundits, sometimes like myself, criticizing the speech before it's half over. You're only watching your favorite channel. You may only hear parts of the speech. Breaking news comes in within minutes so that it's harder to sustain a conversation now on an issue. But I also do think that the lessons of Teddy Roosevelt of speaking simply and explaining things over and over and over again, when he went out on those train trips, and I wish Obama would go out in the country more and talk in the little village stations and get the message simply, especially on health care, to have explained that in the first place, what it meant to the country, might have taken some of the rumors about it away. So um, I think it's harder in this day and age, and I think that's part of it, but I think learning how to use the bully pulpit and get out of the White House more, it's harder again with all the crises that take place to leave, but to be out in the country I think is the key, and that's what Teddy did. I mean, on those train trips, it was incredible. He would stand for hours waving and waving to people um, and just so they could see their president. There's even one moment when he was disappointed because he was waving at a whole group of people and they didn't respond in any way until he found out it was a herd of cows that he was waving. <laughs> so I think there, there are lessons to be learned about speaking simply, saying your message over and over again, um, using metaphors that people understand like Len Lease, you know, with the arsenal of democracy or the fire hose or square deal, and knowing that you have to reach the masses of the public, um, not just with the words that you use that, that might sound better, but maybe not stick as much. We're here in Washington, D.C., and the next call comes from San Diego. This is David in San Diego. Hi, David. You're on with Doris Kearns Goodwin. Hi, uh, good evening. I have read all of your books, Ms. Goodwin. Thank you including wait till next year. Uh, I enjoyed no ordinary time, I guess, of all of your books. I wanted to ask you if you've ever thought, I'm a uh, high school history teacher, if you've ever given any thoughts to writing a history book for either high school or even elementary, because you have the knack of bringing history alive, which is not something that most young people today understand. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for that question. In fact, one of my sons, Michael Goodwin, is a history teacher and an English teacher. And so we've talked about the importance of having history at that level be brought to kids. Because once you capture them then, you know, for the rest of their lives, they'll love history. They may not become an historian. And he's done a wonderful job in our town in Concord because we have all those sites, those Revolutionary War sites. We have all the literary people, Hawthorne and Alcott and Thoreau and Emerson. And he's created this experiential semester-long program where he takes the kids out to all these sites during this semester-long program. And they've become lovers of not only history, but English, even math and science and art, because he shows how it all connects. And education is the most important thing, I think, still in this country for opportunity. When we worry about what's happening in the inner cities, when we worry about the, the fact that a lot of people don't have the same opportunities that they do even in other countries, that they're not getting out of poverty, education is the key. And, and that's only one piece of it to make people love in high school. The subjects we're talking about has to start much earlier and make them love school, because America's democracy depends on it. It is the most important thing. I just wanted to thank you for writing your book about the Brooklyn Dodgers and explaining how it, <laughs> explaining how it brought you and your father closer together. My father gave that book to me. We grew up in Brooklyn. He gave it to me shortly before he died, mm. and it brought us closer together. So thank you. Oh, oh you cannot, I, I cannot thank me enough for that. Thank you so much. 
You know, what happened is Ken Burns did a documentary on the history of baseball and came to interview me. 